Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hello, Steve Mills here, and it's great to be back on the Results Podcast, sharing with you some more tried, tested, and proven ways to uh, to grow your business. And today, I've got something a little bit different. In fact, last week, I was really privileged and uh, and lucky to be on a, a podcast of uh, someone who's in a very short period of time, I think has become a, a really good friend. His name is Michael De Groot, and he um, he calls himself the storyteller. So uh, without further ado, welcome on to the uh, uh, podcast, Michael, and thank you ever so much, A, for interviewing me last week and for being on my podcast this week. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm delighted to be on your podcast. And it's it's been a it's my aim to get on more podcasts actually. I'm I'm doing I'm doing the interviewing usually, but it's good to be yeah, yeah. interviewed for a change. So yeah. <laughs> delighted well, to be here. Well, you found out last week all about me and my life story. So I'm gonna do the same thing uh, this week for you and uh, find out, you know. Um, tell me firstly, you know, where did this the, the storyteller thing come from and, and how did you arrive at that? Right, G- great question. So I got involved um, with creating, let's call them, let's call them for the best kind of description, adverts, video adverts for people. Okay. And they were like, you know, very basic. They were like images with words, a voiceover, kind of image transitions and things like that. Okay, yeah, and, yeah, what type of thing. Yeah, and I discovered the scripts that I was getting from people were just not very good, right? Okay. So I started to change them a little bit, and I said, oh, would you mind if I change the script a little bit? Because it's not really a story. You're just basically saying, here's my product, buy me, right? And I think that's just boring and, and people just not going to remember that. So they went, yeah, okay, you can have a go. So I, I started writing a story for the advert and they went, yeah, actually, we like that. So please go ahead and use that instead. And you carried on doing that to this And day? I just kept going on <laughs> doing that, yeah. And, and therefore... With one of the things that we do is is create animations and and they are now stories rather than just adverts. I mean, at the end of the day, they're stories to promote products and services, but sure. they're not just, you know, the very dry kind of, here's our product, we're the best in the world, please buy us. I think it, it's a real issue for a lot of people, actually, you know, uh, r- writing copy, be that, you know, words on a video or, or words on a website that are written words. Uh, a lot of people are not really skilled in it. They, they try to do it and it finishes up, uh, you know, not as good as it could be, shall we say. And, and that's probably being polite. So how, how did you, you know, what's, what's the history to that? How did you... You know, you go from I don't know, school and leaving school and stuff, and eventually wind up where you are. Tell me a little bit about, more about your history. All right, thank you. So I'm I'm originally from the Netherlands. Um, okay. I was born in Amsterdam. My dad was a Dutchman, and my mother was uh, Anglo Indian. And I, I mention that because it becomes important in a little while. Okay. And um, Kind of had, I hated school, Steve. I, I was not a good student. I didn't enjoy it. I was being shouted at a lot. The teachers were awful. And um, we moved, my father, who he worked for the Bank of America. And we moved, at the age of 13, we moved to uh, South America. And there's a country right at the top of South America in between British Guyana and French Guyana called Suriname. And it was like a Dutch colony or used to be, but it no longer is, of course, it became independent. It was independent, I think, more or less when we were there. And uh, we continued schooling. It was a bit of a culture shock, to be honest. 
And it was the first time in my life that I saw poverty. And it actually compels me, even still today, to volunteer for people that are more vulnerable in our society. Uh -huh. Anyway, I, I went to school there, didn't really get very good grades. And then we were there for about three years. And then we came back to the UK, uh, to the Netherlands, sorry, to the Netherlands. And then I had to continue my schooling then. It was really difficult to keep switching countries and to continue mm. education. So education was rubbish for me. I had no interest in carrying on doing anything, university, none of that was nowhere in my interest. So I did the equivalent of, let's call them O-levels in the Netherlands. Uh -huh. And then my dad was again invited to go abroad. So he, he was basically went abroad and he saved banks that were nearly going bankrupt, basically. Um, he was like a troubleshooter. This time, though, he was being invited to either go to London or the US Virgin Islands, right, in the Caribbean. Okay. Now, in Suriname, there are no beaches, by the way. We were at the top of South America and the beach was mud. There are no beaches. It was just oh. clay. So <laughs> we never went to the beach. There's just jungle and clay near the near the oh, sea. Right. Okay. But US Virgin Islands is something totally different. They've got beautiful yeah. beaches there. Yeah, yeah. But my mother, I mentioned earlier, was Anglo Indian and she loved anything to do with England. You know, okay. she was very British. And she didn't even speak with an Indian accent. She spoke like the Queen, you know, her yeah. English okay, right, right. and perhaps not that posh, but she spoke, you know, very good English yeah. and Dutch, in fact, as well. She learned Dutch. And yeah. um, so, of course, she had to make the choice and we moved to the UK, not to London per se, to Surrey. Surrey and um, we rented a house there through the bank. And we commuted then into London. Well, we didn't have a job yet when we moved here. But what happened was, and I'm saying we because my I've got two older brothers and a twin sister. And, okay. and the eldest brother stayed in the Netherlands and the other three kids came over to the UK and it became our home. So, of course, my parents wanted my sister and I to continue our education in the UK, but we were not that confident with our English. Our English was very good because you have to learn English as a second language in Netherlands anyway. Yeah, My yeah. mother was very British, Anglo-Indian, so she spoke English at home with my dad who worked for an American company. So when we were very young, we couldn't understand English and they spoke in English to each other. Then we went to school, we learned English. Now we could hear what they were talking about if they were talking <laughs> about us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also in the Netherlands, you have English or American programs on TV and they put, put Dutch subtitles on. So you're also learning English by watching, hearing the English, but then seeing what the translation is. So we have many ways and, and we got like in those days, they gave you like a score for your uh, grades. We had nines and tens for our English because we were like top of the class. Because right, we had right, we had right. help at home, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we came to the UK. I didn't want to continue my education. It was interrupted in the Netherlands when we came over, and I said, "No, I'm going to look for a job." And the reason I said that before we came over, we had to spend like six months doing a bit of temping work, and we did that for an uncle, and we got paid for it. So I had the taste of money. Okay. Oh, then being convinced to come to the UK and study again, I went, forget it. I know what it's like to have money in my life. Yeah. I want to earn money. So yeah, you're get at, out the age of, yeah. at the age of 17, I went job hunting in London. Okay. Because where we were in Surrey, Farnham in Surrey, there were just no jobs to, to be got there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And we want, I wanted a job <clears throat> where I could use my Dutch learn my English in business, obviously. Yeah. And that's all I was looking for. I wasn't looking for a career in any particular industry. Right. And I landed in a company called Burlington Klopman, which was a textile, American textile company. And they were based right in the heart of London at Oxford Circus. They had a head office there. 
They had factories in Ireland and then factories in Italy. And they made polyester fabric, which they supplied to all over Europe. And Marks and Spencer's was a massive customer. All right. Okay. That started that that desire to get into <laughs> into a job where I could use my Dutch. And I had to, my yeah, job yeah, was yeah. dealing with the Benelux office, which was based in Belgium. So oh, okay. Benelux stands for Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. Okay. And they and they needed somebody who could liaise in Dutch. Well. The thing was, even in Belgium, Belgium, they can speak English, so it doesn't really matter. And uh, I spent, and that started a twenty-eight year career in the textile industry. Oh, well, wow, wow! <laughs> I, I spent, I did everything. I mean, I I joined as a sample coordinator, uh -huh. and I reached the dizzy heights of sales and marketing director in a number of different organizations. Okay, great. Uh, that's, and that's where your sort of marketing uh, sort of experience and knowledge yes, came from. Yeah. Yes, right, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Although it was very different there than what I might be employing today, to be honest. But yeah, it gave me it gave me the confidence to speak. It gave me the confidence to sell. It gave me this confidence to think about how to get in front of customers and market yourself, yeah, as a company, definitely. Fantastic. Okay. So so that that was the the process basically. And then uh, after twenty eight years, I was getting a bit fed up with it. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. I had one of these, let's call them epiphanies. Yeah. Where First of all, my marriage I broke down. On a regular basis, so uh, yeah, it was a, it was a midlife crisis. Yes, my marriage broke down. Okay, um, I I wanted to do other. I wanted to work for myself somehow, but I didn't know oh. what. Okay, and I had to look at myself, and I went on in two thousand and four. I went on a personal development course and I won't tell you the whole backstory because it will just take too long why I got to this but I went to a personal development course by a gentleman called Anthony Robbins yeah I know I know uh, and, very well yeah 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 it's called unleash the power within in London uh, Excel yeah I, I was I was being being myself so uh, great great absolutely. you're a fellow firewalker fantastic I am, yeah indeed <laughs> and Steve I'll tell you what I had never been exposed to anything like that in my oh, life great, forever, yeah, yeah. forever, yeah. you know, until I was like standing there in this place. I had to sign a certificate to say, you know, a waiver that you're going to walk on fire, hot coals. And I yeah. went, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a trick, right? Got into the auditorium and one of the first things that he does, but halfway through the first day, uh, he gets you to prepare for the firewalk. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, that's just like mind games, you know. Yeah. Then he took us outside. In those days, there were not as much people as there are in these days, but he took us outside and we stood around a fire. They were burning wood and there were metal rails all around this fire. And he was talking on a microphone. There were speakers outside in the car park and he was shouting loud and we were going, saying different things and he was introducing us to the fire and getting us like yeah. and the heat was fierce you know yeah yeah i remember it and well then, then we went back in and we and i went that was it in my mind i was totally okay. skeptical right. in my mind i'm going that was it think, so you didn't think you were going to actually walk no, on fire no? no way i thought it was a mind trick you know right. like a Darren brown well yeah, yeah, i thought yeah. it was a metaphor i thought it was a yes. metaphor and then, then he took us all outside and we're all like, take your shoes and socks off. And I did practice all the kind of, you know, the routine in terms of warming up for it. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. took us out in the car park. I can't see any fire. It's, it's black, pitch black. I can't see anything. I can hear all these drums going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People <laughs> shouting, yes, yes, yes. Anyway, all of a sudden I'm queuing up. I went, oh, what's all this about? I'm presented with this with this lane of hot coals in front of me. And uh -huh. I went, oh bleep. 
<laughs> what what is this? I've got to walk on it now. So luckily, I had rehearsed in the auditorium, and when I went out there, I walked and I didn't burn my feet. So I was. And but after I walked, because I've been so skeptical about it, I'd never done anything like it in my life. I basically felt I could do anything. I yeah, could yeah. achieve anything in life. I was, I was indestructible now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember, remember my my first walk. You know, I thought, well, do you know what? It, you know, there, there's several thousand people here. There's no way everybody's going to get burned, and and people, were, you know, I was in the queue like you were, and people were going across and getting getting across without, you know, getting burned. And I thought, do you know what? I'm sure I can do this. But when you stand at the end of that fire, and yeah. it's like your turn to step on some coals that are 1,500 degrees mm. and, and walk. Um, you know, it, it's tough. It's not easy, is it? I mean, that, you know, it's like every part of your brain and your body is saying, don't do this. Steve. Oh, my God. And, uh, and you take that, I mean, as Tony says, taking the first step is really difficult. Taking the second one is really easy. <laughs> yes. You know, you just you just keep going, you know, and uh, till they tell you to stop. And, uh, yeah, it, 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 I'm totally with you. It's an amazing experience. And anybody listening to this podcast, if you've not done the Tony Robbins thing, then, uh, you know, go and do it. Uh, um, unleash so I, the power within. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely life changing and a little advert for him for the first time he's coming to Birmingham this year. Oh, is he really? Sorry, next well, year, 2020, sorry, next year. 2020, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's coming to Birmingham, so it's not in London. It's, okay. It's in Birmingham for the first time, and okay. um, so it's my kind of neck of the woods, Birmingham. So are you so. going to go again? Are you going to do it again? Well, I've been, ever since then, this was 2004, I've been crewing following that every okay. single year. Right. Right, right. Okay. Uh, so since 2005, I've crewed. I did it for about um, six times. Okay. Well, I have crewed now in total six times. Right. And um, I will be crewing again next year. So I started again in 2018, did, 20, did this year, and I'll be doing next year. So I will have crewed about seven times. But wow. it's, it's great That's fun. Good. I mean, it's voluntary. You don't get paid. No, no. You yeah, get yeah. you get meal vouchers, so yeah. you can get food. Yeah. But the experience of being immersed in that environment is just yeah. like a, you know, another shot in the arm, basically. But it also tests you because crewing is not easy at all. No, uh, it's very tiring and it's long days, and yeah. but you learn a huge amount. I actually learned more crewing the first year, the first three years after I'd done UPW. Yeah, yeah. Going back crewing, I learned more about Tony Robbins' techniques and technologies than I did when I actually did the course. Wow. wow. Uh, because you get repetition with some of the crew directors that take you through all of the different technologies for free yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the kind of gaps where, you, where you're not crewing or having to do things. Uh, yeah. So you get some free training from people that have been doing it, like trainers that have been doing it for a long time. So uh -huh. it's it's uh, I never became a trainer. It's not really what I wanted to do, but yeah. Anyway, so yeah. after I did that, yeah, um, well, I just looked at my job in just a totally different light. Then uh -huh. uh, I signed up for the whole mastery program. Right. I did okay. life mastery, wealth mastery first in London, life mastery in Puerto Rico. D um, um, Date, date with David Destiny. Destiny in Australia on the Gold Coast. Did you? Wow, wow. I traveled to New Zealand as well. So I was away from work for four weeks, which was a real struggle with my boss because he told me I'd booked all of this and he told me I couldn't go for such a long time. And in the end, after me sulking for two weeks, he, he allowed me to go, um, which was the job I then eventually left. But... Yeah. Um, and then I also did leadership mastery in San Diego, San Diego, uh, for a week. So I had all these great technologies, understanding, or so I thought, and information that allowed me to go. 
you know something? I've got to start something on my own. Yeah. At the same time, I also, around 2004, I also changed the way that I looked at my own life and what I ate and drank. And so in 2004, I gave up alcohol, I gave up meat, I became much healthier. And I had had a health problem prior to that with my, let's, let's call them stomach area. And um, I went to visit this, this lady. I was actually, well, the story is, I'll tell you a little story because people love stories. Yeah. Whilst I was kind of immersed in a textile industry, my designer, there was a senior designer and I, we traveled to New York to see Victoria's Secrets. They were, they were unknown in Europe, but they were a massive big underwear brand in, uh, in the United States. And we were there going to promote our new range to see if we could break into the US market with our fabrics. And incidentally, all the designers in the New York office were all British. <laughs> so it was really easy to chat with yeah, them. Yeah. But um, traveling on the plane, I was sharing with um, my colleague, the mm -hmm. senior designer, that I had had some health problems with my stomach. And, um, and she said, oh, you need to go and see such and such in Leicester and, and get some, you know, kinesiology and yeah. blah, blah, blah. She said, Reiki, blah, blah. I said, stop. You're just talking Chinese to me. You might as well talk Chinese. What the hell are you talking about? You know, Reiki, ki you know, kinesiology. What is all this? So she started explaining it to me. I took the courage when I came back to the UK to go to this lady in Leicester uh, called Terry Larder. And she kind of waved my took hold of my arm, uh, told me to uh, meet the pressure, and she pushed down on my arm, put some test files on my body, supplements on my body, tested my arm again, tested my leg. She said, oh, yeah, I know what you've got. You've got candida overgrowth. I said, what the hell is that? Is that some sexually transmitted disease or what? <laughs> she said, no, 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 uh, it's not. Anyway, take these supplements, take this, stop eating bananas, do this, do the other. And within the space of three weeks, I was cured of the issue that I had. Now, my, my twin sister suffers with Crohn's disease. Okay. And I thought I was getting that, basically, because we're a twin, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was like copying her. But it wasn't at all. It was just some candida, which you can get through eating lots of sugar. And I used to eat a lot of sugar. You know, I was a sugar I, junkie. Yeah, yeah. And I was overweight and, and everything else. And um, so this took me on a journey of kind of discovery, of finding out alternative health. And I ended up then waking up. I was living on my own and I had a dream, no word of a lie. And I woke up because I've been thinking about what shall I do then on my own, you know, after having been on Robbins. And yeah. I literally woke up one morning and I went, I want to become a nutritionist and teach people how to improve their life and their diet and food. And at that time, I'd lost in the space of three months, I'd gone and improved my health and I'd lost like 44 pounds in three months. Did you? Wow. Uh, which was right. just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've never been able to repeat it. But no. and, and that on top of that, there was the whole Tony Robbins thing, you know, that even yeah. pushed me through because I then I'd already started the journey in January of 04. And when I got to April and then heard all the stuff around meat and alcohol that Tony yeah. and Joseph yeah, yeah. McClendon were sharing, I went, yeah. oh, my God, I'm going in the right. And then I started a course on kinesiology to learn how to do muscle testing, which of course Tony uses for different reasons, but I wanted to do muscle testing for health. So I, I then was working, um, but then also studying kinesiology and health. Well, the reason I got into kinesiology, another quick story, is I rang this lady who treated me with kinesiology in Leicester and I said, I want to become a nutritionist. How can I become, become one? She said, well, do you really want to do that? Why don't you become a kinesiologist? And I went, ah, oh, that's far too difficult. I could never do that. That's obviously, you shouldn't be saying things like that. 
Yeah. And uh, she said, well, why don't you ring this nutritionist who's now also a kinesiologist? She studied nutrition first, realized that she couldn't do enough for people. And then she searched for something else and became a kinesiologist. And now she uses both things and can do much more for people. So I rang this complete stranger. I don't even know her name. Asked her that question and she said, no, you've got to do kinesiology first and then do nutrition. Well, okay. the course included nutrition anyway. So I spent then the next three years studying kinesiology and became a qualified kinesiologist. But my aim was never wanting to really be on the high street with a, like a health shop. Plus, no. Nobody had heard of kinesiology. No one could even spell it. And kinesiology, okay. just very briefly, is the study of movement. That's that's what it means. Okay. Okay. And you kind of go, because they use it in sport, right? Yeah, right but this right. is for yeah. health. This is for okay. health. Every single muscle is connected to an organ in our body. Yeah. So if you move the muscle into a certain direction, you get a reading of what's going on there. If you put something into the energy field of the body or put something on your skin, the body knows what you're putting there. And all this communication goes to the hypothalamus in the brain and the hypothalamus knows what's going on and the muscle goes either weak or strong depending whether a food or a substance or an emotion is good or bad for you. Okay. So it really just, it's like magic and... I loved it, but I didn't want to be on the high street treating Joe Public. I did do some of that in my home, but right. that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do, I had a much bigger idea. I wanted to go into companies and help them with the disease and the stress that was happening in the absenteeism inside of companies. I had a much bigger picture, right. much bigger dream. Sounds exciting. It yeah. was it was hugely exciting. I've met this lady, um, Tracy Ann Croshaw, called Tian, who was a who is a mind coach and she does hypnotherapy. And the two of us joined forces to work together, and we ran a program called um, Mind Your Wellness. And by the way, hence my company name, which is called Staying Alive UK. Yeah, yeah. And literally, that name also came up in a dream. I literally woke up with the name Staying wow. Alive. And of course, it was really effective because everybody knows Staying Alive, the song. Yeah, so yeah, when, yeah. When, people, when you say Staying Alive, that's the first thing people hear in their head. So from yeah. a marketing yeah, yeah, point yeah. of view, it just, good, it? it just worked. It, it really linked. It's like linking one thing to like a, a good thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. it, it was such an upbeat and great song. And... Uh, I like that. That's a really good marketing idea, I think. I didn't realise it's the famous song on the planet, the most famous song on really? the planet. Yes, wow. yes. Staying wow. Alive is like the, yeah. apart from Happy Birthday, I think Staying yeah. Alive is yeah, the next yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we ran these programmes, public programmes, called Mind Your Wellness, and that was to help people. We had like a wellness inventory that people filled out, I also learned something called psychocalisthenics, which is a 17-minute exercise that allows you to get energy into the body, which is great to do even before you meditate. I, and I learned that as well. So we had this amazing program. We ran workshops in Wales. And then we wanted to break into companies together. So my first meeting with a company in Yorkshire, I won't mention the name, it's a bank, okay. famous bank in Yorkshire. You're from okay. that part of the world. I am indeed. And um, sitting opposite the human resources director, who was male, and his assistant, who was female. I mention it for on purpose because of what happens next. And I ha we have this wellness inventory, and it allows people. And now this was 2007, right? This is a long time ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Looking after people's health in organizations was not a buzzword. It wasn't something that people did, right? If people had stress, they would go, yeah. you know, sort it out, basically. Yeah, don't be so soft. Yeah, yeah. Especially yeah. in Yorkshire. <laughs> Especially in Yorkshire. Yeah, well, wait for it. And then on this inventory, which I got from America, I had the license from America to use, because people ask, 
questions and you get this little pie chart that uh -huh. says whether you're doing high or low in these areas so like are you standing regularly so movement was one of them you know uh, exercise was another eating yeah. was another one and it gives you okay. all these questions and then you get this little pie chart but there was also a category called love okay and the guy turned around and said no 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 sorry we can't do this we don't do love here that's exactly what he said. All you, all you need is love. I mean, we don't do well. love here. We don't do right? love. <laughs> and that was my first meeting. I was totally devastated when I walked out. I went, oh, my God, this is not going to work, right? And um, I'd driven up miles. I mean, you've just been up north, and it's like a yeah. very long way. I'd driven up miles, and I was so despondent to take the drive all the way down. But not despair. Uh, Chian, or Tracy Ann, has contacts in Virgin. Went, yes, Virgin. So we managed to get into Virgin trains. Wow. And um, they were so impressed by the look of our program and the workshop that we delivered, because we delivered like a little bit of facts, we got a bit of engagement in the room. Okay. We did a bit of meditation with some music, some really powerful music, and Tracy Ann took them through like a visualization. Right. It was, they went, right, first of all, can you do it on the training managers? And we went, yeah, we'll do. And if the training managers like it, then we're going to roll it out to the rest of our company. Okay. Training managers loved it. Had a lovely lunch with the HR director in in Birmingham, where Virgin Trains are based, yeah. and the head office is based. And yeah, all systems go. We want to do this, but we want to give you a challenge. Can you do this on the long term sick that have been absent for years because it's costing wow. us yeah, literally yeah. millions? It just shows you the you know the value in something like that. Yeah, and, and we yeah. said, yeah, we're going to go for that. Absolutely brilliant, fantastic. Everybody was like happy. Then this was 2007. On the 15th of September, which is my birthday, right? Northern Rock happens. Northern Rock goes pop. Yeah. There's yeah. a run on the bank. Oh. The start of the recession, the start yeah. of the default credit yeah. swaps, whatever you want to call that, it. Yeah. Yeah. It all started going pear shape. Yeah. We that chased them, we chased them, we chased them. Eventually, we heard from January, like second, third week in January, saying, actually, guys, there's a lot of stuff going on in the market. Yeah. We're really sorry. <clears throat> We're not going to be able to do anything here. We're not going to run the program. Mm. Well, Steve, I was still quite early on in running my business. And yeah. I hadn't quite differentiated the difference between yourself and your business, right? Yeah. So I thought I was the business. Yeah. So I took it so personally, it rocked my world yeah. tremendously. And oh, I literally yeah. just lost all faith in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I, money was running out, maxed out on credit cards, on second mortgages, you name it. Not not a good place to be at all. I needed to earn money. So my sister, Trudy, I better mention her name. Trudy introduced me to an e-learning company who then um, I did some freelance sales for. And I'll quickly fast forward. That lasted about, let's call it 18 months, two years. And I was telling the boss that really he needed to focus on social media because social media started to emerge in like 2008, 2009. Uh -huh. And he went, no, 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 this, that's just not going to happen. I don't want to know what people have had for their breakfast and their coffees yeah, and this yeah, and yeah. the other Twitter. Yeah. And yeah, I said, yeah, no, but yeah. there's another program called LinkedIn that I'm on. Uh -huh. No, 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 it's, it's just not going to happen. Anyway, um, I, was, I was then interviewed for a sales director role in that company, it pitched up against other people and had to do all sorts of really tricky kind of test interviews with, okay, this is a phone call you're going to have with a client. What do you say? And 
anyway, I failed it. And but it was a massive gift. So I went packing, I went away and I was then headhunted by a and by the way, this was an e-learning company who didn't use video. They only had text based okay. e-learning, which was dreadful because I also said to them, you need to have video. Yeah. I mean, they've corrected it since after yeah. I left. But anyway, then I was approached by a video e-learning company in London. Right. And I did some freelance sales for them. Okay. okay. But unfortunately, we couldn't agree contract terms in terms of my commission because people I was introducing also wanted to become resellers. And I went, hold yeah. on a minute. I'm not going to earn from those people because they're also no, becoming no. resellers. And they went, yeah, well, reselling is not part of the contract. I said, well, can we rewrite the contract, please? They went, yeah, go ahead. So I spent a lot of money with a lawyer rewriting the contract. Anyway, it didn't end well. I basically redid the contract, spent money on it, and I never heard back. And I went, right. okay. I was not meant, that's when I realized I had all these messages. I, and I was basically told, Michael, you're not supposed to work for anybody. Mm -hmm. You've got to work for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I still hadn't learned the lesson, but I won't go into that. <laughs> so okay. I went, okay, one great gift at this video learning company. They showed me how to create these little animations that we talked about right at the beginning with short like images, voiceover and text and whatever to create little adverts and stuff, which they use for their kind of e-learning. Yeah. And I learned how to create that. And that took me on this journey. Now, when I was with the other e-learning company, I came across something called whiteboard animation that I'd never seen before, where you see a hand drawing a picture on, this, uh, on, a, yeah, on yeah, a whiteboard, yeah. right? Yeah. I tracked down the company who were in Brighton, not far from where you are now, yeah. and finally got hold of them. And basically, they made them for a company, and people check them out, called RSA Animate, the Royal okay. Society, Society of Art. And they had something called RSA Animate, which were about 15, 20 minute lectures that they animated. So all you could hear was the voice of the lecture and this animation going. Okay. And I was mesmerized by this. I yeah. went, yeah, oh yeah. my God, this is amazing. Wow. Fantastic. So I phoned, I phoned them up. I said, tell me, what's the cost for doing something like that? And they went, are you sitting down? I said, first of all, we have a six to 12 month waiting list because it's wow. so popular. And secondly, to do one of those, it's going to cost you 15 grand. Wow. So I went, no way my boss is going to pay for that. This is what's no. the first e-learning company. Anyway, yeah. but I, and indeed, it was no way he could afford it. Okay. But I kept it in my head. And then after I learned the other skill with this other video e-learning company and did this all from, I mean, it was around about the same time when I got myself, I moved from, Microsoft to Mac. And okay. yeah. I've got all these amazing tools on my Mac now that I had never come across. Yeah, yeah. So I was doing all of this kind of practicing on video and learning online and this, that, and the other. And I was like, I don't know where I'm going with all of this, you uh, know? Uh, yeah, yeah. And then out of the blue, I don't know, I don't even know how I came across it. Somebody came out with a piece of software that allows you to do these whiteboard animations that were being done by hand through stop motion filming. Okay. And I went amazing. So I practiced and I practiced and I practiced for hours to learn this skill, to master my yeah. craft. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then coupled with that, learning how to write stories and scripts and, and making it engaging and interesting, and then moving away from stock art to getting illustrators to draw bespoke art, um, teaching them how they need to get the files to me so that okay. I could take their files and produce it and get finding voiceovers and getting voiceovers to read the script and giving them instructions and then finding music and putting music yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. So it's, it's literally been hours, days, months, years of honing my craft. Honing that craft, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, learning how to do this. 
And that has brought me to a place where I kept the company name and what I call myself now is Chief Storyteller at Staying Alive UK. Yeah, brilliant, and brilliant. We, we produce bespoke, visually impactful cartoons, animation campaigns, where we engage audiences and giving them a unique insight into an organization's story and value proposition. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, and, um, and then on top of that, in the la literally in the last 12 to 18 months, I'm now also delivering storytelling workshops and teaching okay, small right. businesses how they can, not the animation part, but how they can speak and share their story more elegantly uh, through storytelling rather than go at a networking event. Hi, yeah. I'm Michael. Uh, I create animations. You know? Okay. Right. Just, uh, I want to hear more about that, Michael, in, in a couple of minute, uh, seconds. But just to let you know, I've just noticed the system that we use for podcasts has actually got a limit on time. So we've got about four minutes left. Yes, uh, to talk about that. So, just what I, what I didn't want to do is get to the end and have to have to rush it. Yes. So, um, just to let you know that. So, t tell us a little bit more about what that and what you're doing, and, and how you can maybe help people. I think. Right. Great question. So, the the headline is: How do you stand out from the crowd? Mm. How is your marketing, and you're a marketing professional, how Indeed. is your marketing going to be different? Yeah. Right? So we all know adverts. And the first question I always ask people says, do you like the adverts? And I get a mixed response. But when I ask people, so, okay, tell me the last advert you saw, which one can you remember? And people can't really remember any, uh -huh. apart from one. And that is the Christmas John Lewis advert. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we know, of course, that the Christmas John Lewis, and we're talking about the UK here, the Christmas John Lewis advert, of course, is a story. Yeah, it is. Right? And therefore, that's why they remember it. Yeah. And it invokes an emotion of some kind. Yeah. And that's why they remember it. Yeah. Then when I say to people, okay, what about the movies? And now all hands go up. Yeah, we love the movies. I said, do you go to the cinema? Yeah, we go to the cinema. I said, do you watch Netflix? Netflix? Yeah, we watch Netflix. I said, well, what is it about the movies you love? And of course, everybody realizes when they're in a storytelling right. workshop, yeah. it's yeah. the story, right? Yeah. yeah. But then it's like, well, why do you stay in a movie? Right. First of all, you can't even remember adverts that are literally three minutes, three sec sorry, 30 seconds long, <laughs> that are 30 seconds long. You can't remember the advert. But you go to a movie which is three hours long and you can remember the movie, right? Yeah. So what is, what's the difference apart from storytelling? Because if you went to the movie and they told you the whole plot in the first 30 seconds, you wouldn't even have a chance to finish your popcorn. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm conscious now. Are you running out of time now? <laughs> no, we're, we're now down to 144. So, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, you, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. It, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it, stories are, are, are a real key, I think, to marketing. And I love your analogy about, you know, standing out. I, I, I call it being outstanding yeah. by standing out, you know, and, yeah. and, and it doesn't mean you've got to be the best, but just be different, really, you know. And uh, I think stories are a fantastic uh, sort of tool. Um, so we, we, we need to sort of think about bringing it to a close. So what I'm, I'm really keen to do is get a, an understanding of, of what people, you know, if people want to uh, perhaps hire you, go on your workshops uh, and so on, what, what do they need to do? What, what's the best action for them to take? Well, the, the best action for them to take is to, they can Google, if they just Google at Staying Alive UK, they will find everything about me. That'd be the easiest route to go. They'll find my website, my LinkedIn, my Twitter, uh, etc. If they, okay. so all they need to do is look for at Staying Alive UK or go to stayingaliveuk.com and send me a message through there. And obviously I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, and I pretty much use the same handle everywhere else. Okay. Um, I'm not active 
not active on on the devil, which I call Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Um, but <laughs> and that's for personal reasons because I have I have a love hate relationship with Mark Zuckerberg, and okay. um, but everywhere else you should be able to find me, but particularly LinkedIn. Okay, great, great. I'm a, as you know, a passionate believer in that as well. So, uh, fantastic. So, uh, all I'd like to do is just finish by, you know, thanking you very much for your time today. I really do appreciate it, and uh, uh, it was great to uh, great to talk to you. And I look forward to uh, uh, meeting up one day, perhaps at a. Tony, uh, the next Tony Robbins seminar in uh, in Birmingham uh, next spring. So uh, uh, thank you very much, Michael. And um, once again, uh, thank you, everybody, for being on the podcast. Thank you. Cheers, Steve. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 